So, Glyn. Hello, David. This is the Bobby Davro podcast, Glyn. This is the this Bobby is the Davro one. one. The one the with one. Bobby Davro. If this was an episode of Friends, yeah. they would say the one with Bobby Davro, wouldn't it? It would, yeah. That's, that's a good title for it. Maybe we should Be- make that. Because it title. is the one with Bobby it's Davro, true. isn't it? Yeah, it's just fact, um, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and we, we've just had that chat with him, which you're about to hear, and it was lovely. It was a really nice chat, wasn't it? It was great. There's so many things we covered, and it was just nice to hear him talk about the business, about all the people he's met. And in fact, there's, mm. the, I remember when we met him at Mostly Comedy in person, we talked about so many other people as well. So there was so many, so many stories I was thinking, oh, I'd like to hear that one again, or I'd like to mm. him to... But there was a, loads of other ones that he told. So it was, yeah, it was great. It was a really fun time to our time, what are we talking about? Time of your life. You've had a time fun time of your life. That, that time, that hour or whatever it was we just spent was just great. Just passed. Yeah. 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 But, oh, and by the way, this is the More Than Mostly Comedy podcast, in case you don't know. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, we might as well just go, because it's, it's quite a long one, because we yeah. kept going yeah. in a good way, and we could have kept going longer as well. Yeah, um, we could have done. But let's let you listen to that right now. So here yeah. we have Bobby Navarro. So we are here today, very excitingly, uh, in, well, in a Zoom sense anyway, with the fantastic Bobby Davro. Hello, Bobby. How are you doing? Hello now. Just to check, I, 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 I have phones working. It's uh, perfectly. <laughs> and so uh, I, 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 I think like, yeah, this. Uh, so there you go. Mine's yeah, that's good. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's, it's so nice to see you. Now, I look a bit stressed. It's got nothing to do with the show. No. I'm, I'm so looking forward to talking to everyone. Thank you for uh, to joining up. Um, and we should have a good uh, 45, 50 minutes, however long it'll take. Yeah. Um, and, but I've just had the most stressful time. I did something dreadful today. My daughter is a vegetarian. Right. And a bit of an animal lover, as I yeah. am as well. But uh, I've got a friend of mine called Charlie, Charlie Claw, we call him. And he sells lobsters and crabs and fish food and stuff. And he right. came around and I phoned around my friends and said, uh, I'll have a couple of, um, I've got some lobsters to sell. That's uh, because I've got nothing else to sell at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I've left the lobsters out in a box. Did they fall off the back of an aquarium or something? No, yeah. yeah, well, they're not an aquarium. No, I've got the fish. We'll talk about fish in a minute. But yeah. I've got these lobsters to sell, and I've left them out in a box. And my daughter's right. come in and has gone hysterical because she's seen these lobsters slapping about, and you know. So she's she's gone on a, a bit of a thing. So I've got a, I've got her boyfriend to take them away now to a local restaurant. So. Can I just check? That was my twenty quid profit. Okay. <laughs> what, what, what was the name of the guy you got it from? Is it Charlie Claw? Did you say Charlie Claw? He's, Charlie going, yes. he's a big deal, boy. We got some nice lobsters for you. How many lobsters? <laughs> so they smell that smell, but they're awful. He said, "Well, they're very fresh." I said, "I know it smells so good." He said, "Well, we caught them this morning, and they walked up the up the beach there. They walked into the the, the, the van, got them in the box. They walked in there, and I said, well, they must have stepped inside on the way there.' So there you go. It's an old guy." <laughs> But, I um, mean, if, if your name's Charlie Claw, you've got to go into the lobster selling business. Charlie Claw, yeah. he's got crabs as well. But we don't Has he? <laughs> um, well, uh, we have to say as well, Bobby. I mean, the people who are listening to this when they listen back yes. to it won't be able to see this. But you've got a lovely house that we can see in view there. You got oh, yeah, baby grand piano. My, line, my lines. Yeah, it puts ours to shame. I tell Look you. That. That. And, like, and the piano behind you as well. Oh yes, the old piano. The old, yeah. uh... Do you play pianos? Uh, no, yeah, David I, does. I do. Yeah, yeah. Are you good? We'll, we'll make you get a tune out of it later. Yeah. yeah. It, I'm drinking. It, um, I'm drinking just the Coca Cola, of course. Oh, nice. I don't touch the alcohol. Oops, I don't touch it. <laughs> so um, I'm outside a, of I'm like... a whiskey drinker, I love my whiskey like I love my women. Eighteen years old, single, mixed up with coke. There you go. It's a gag a minute. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Aside from the uh, lobster situation, Bobby, yes. how, you, how are you dealing with the current whole COVID thing? Are you you getting right. on all right? Or honestly, yeah, go on. I'm in a bad place because. Um, Obviously, all my work has got cancelled. I mean, I haven't worked for so long, I'm beginning to speak Scouse. Um, <laughs> no disrespect to the Scouses, of course. Um, but uh, it's, it, it's pretty bad. You know, I opened up my diary yesterday and I got snow blinded. It's, there's nothing, everything's been taken out. And yeah. um, it's a very scary time for entertainers. It'll be the same mm. for you. Yes. It'll be the same for anyone that's a comedian, entertainer or an actor yeah. or something. Um, and it, it is, it's, uh, it's really tough at the minute. So fingers yeah. crossed that it comes back. I hope so. If you yeah, don't come yeah. back, I'm going to... Not only sell lobsters, I'm going to have to sell the kids as well. <laughs> what sort of stuff um, had you got planned so far this year? I mean, I, saw, I have seen sort of advertised some theatre stuff. Yeah, um, it, what unfortunately sort of it all got cancelled. I was yeah, going yeah, to do yeah. an Easter pantomime, um, mm. Snow White and the, and the uh, Seven Dwarfs. Of course, it's, it was going to be Snow White and the Six Dwarfs because Sneezy wasn't allowed to take part. <laughs> um, but we were going to do Wizard of Oz, actually. And uh, uh, we're going to go out and up and down the country doing a pantomime at Easter now. I mean, yeah. I did. Hmm. 
Uh, but that unfortunately got cancelled the week that it uh, that we were due to start the rehearsals. Right. And then all my summer work got taken out, and then it doesn't look like we're going to be doing a pantomime at Christmas. So no, I'm going to have to go back to my old job, which made more money than I did out of show business. I used to collect uh, 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 goldfish farts for spirit levels. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm not in a particularly great place. No, um, no, which is a bit I, sad, but I, you know, I, I mustn't complain. We we'll always look on the bright side, as, as the song says. Mm, and yeah. I'm, I'm healthy, touch wood. We were very worried about uh, the missus. You know, we were a bit worried. And I took to the doctor, she had a bit of a temperature. And they, they told me, the doctor said, I don't know whether it's uh, coronavirus or, or Alzheimer's. I said, What do I do? He said, Well, drive to the middle of the countryside, drop her off. And if she makes it back home, don't let her in. Win <laughs> so, win. You've got um, to keep yeah. laughing about these things. But yeah, 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 yeah. Fingers crossed yeah. it comes back next year. Well, yeah, that's the thing. And I mean, I think you come and go through it, don't you? Because I have moments where I think, oh, I'm okay. But then other moments where it's just really, really hard to consider because it just, just keeps going. But then, like you say, we've got our health and so many people haven't got that. That's so it. that's, yeah. that's yeah. the other side of it. And I want to say stop. But thank you very much to the NHS. And I was out there. Yeah. Clapping every Thursday. Have they stopped that now? Haven't they? They, they have, yeah. They sort, of, yeah. sort of, they had an official end, didn't they? But um, I think I've heard people doing it still, though. So, I well, know. I go out every Thursday, whether or not it stops or starts. And, and I don't actually clap. I, I've got like this big saucepan. I hit it with a big spoon, oh, right. and uh, it covers the noise of the empty bottles going in my dustbin. <laughs> Brilliant. So, <laughs> Um, so, I mean, you're uh, we're quite lucky in the sense having you today because I, I, I would define you as a household name. I, yes. I, I, well, yes. so is Domestos, but he flushed that down the toilet. <laughs> yeah, I am a sort of household name, I guess. Yeah. I, I've been around a long time, 40 years I've been doing it now. Which is which is yeah. amazing, and um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's extraordinary, you know, and for people like us as well, because we're like, well, I'm 40 next year. To have someone who, as long as long, yeah, all right, thanks, Glenn. And to have, <laughs> to have someone who's you always, don't, you don't look for it. You used to, but you don't look. For it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, but 40 it's a lot. Is as, the new, forty is the new twenty. You know that, don't you? Is it? Well, let, let's you try saying that the speed cameras on the A3. You get that. <laughs> yeah, I've got a big bulldog clip on the back of my head that sort of fits. That um, <laughs> no, was but, Cliff Richard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I think his clips come off if anything. But, I think um, it has as well. Yeah, it's but I mean. Off. I mean, what would you say? Um, how have you maintained your longevity? I mean, is is um, is it adapting? Is it um, what do you think? Listen, it is adapting, and it's terrible um, climate at the moment with all this business going on. Um, it's very easy to look back, and uh, I've seen a lot of things that they're going to try and ban some of the shows that were on back in the eighties, like the the um, Forty Towers and uh, and uh, some of the stuff. You can't judge you can't judge people by what we were doing 30, 40 years ago. You just can't. That's not fair. Um, I think if you were doing that kind of material, I mean, I was horrified. Someone sent me a video to sign, a DVD, which I made in 1992. And mm. if I'm honest, I was horrified because I couldn't believe some of the jokes I was doing. But then right. it seemed to be acceptable then. But yes. now it's no longer acceptable. And if you're still doing that kind of stuff, you deserve all the criticism you, you deserve. Yeah. But you can't judge people on things that have gone in the past. How did you start out? Were you were you doing impressions at school, or was it what what was the, what did you always want to be a performer? Did you know you were going to be a performer? Do you think? When I was about uh, ten years old, I, I said to my dad. My dad said, "Do well, I think about ten, twelve. I was at school. I was doing the impressions of the teachers. That's usually how you, you, you start. Mm. Um, and we, I did impersonate the teacher. In fact, we had a headmaster, Hindle, Doctor Hindle. Sounds like some some dreadful um, uh, scientist, doesn't it, Doctor yeah. Hindle? <laughs> And he was a lovely, lovely man. And he felt like Howard Wilson. And he used to do his feedback and I'll show you that. And he said, the attention page 460 the physics books. And I started impersonating and impersonating my friends. And then I started looking at um, characters on on uh, albums before on television. There was only three channels then. Channel 4 didn't even exist. And it, it, I, I looked at television programs. And I was doing the obvious ones, Frank Spencer's and the Norman Wisdom. And then I had an audition for um, when I was 16 for Opportunity Knox. Do you remember Op Knox? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Huey Green, Frank Cashin, Fury Green. The poor man, he died of uh, a venereal disease. He got 100 on the clapometer. For those of you, that, that's the gag. Um, so for those of you who remember it, so I wrote a letter to one of my heroes at the time, was Mike Yarwood, because Mike Yarwood was the big mimic at the time. Hmm. And a, a lovely man. He was a lovely, lovely man. And he was, um, a, he was the king of impressions. I wrote him a letter. Uh, and saying, I'm going to appear, or I'm doing an audition for Opportunity Knox. I never got on, to, on the show, but he wrote me a beautiful letter, which I keep in my office, uh, signed, and he said, well, good luck with everything. And what he's, he said to me sticks, and it always stuck with me, he said, try and be as original as possible. Always try and do your own thing. Don't copy me. And a lot of people would copy my guy, and I did when I, mm. when I started. You know, I, And it, there's a lovely story about when he used to do Dave Allen. Do you remember Dave Allen? Yes. Yeah. 
Now, like Yarwood used to do Dave Allen and used to go, Lord, it's Dave Allen. Good night, God bless me, God bless Now, Dave Allen's left thing, this looks like my right one, doesn't it, to you? Yes. It's not yeah, holding yeah. up my left one. It's, it's, it's inverted. And he couldn't bend his, this finger, this left one. So he used to bend the right one. And he used right. to go, Good night, God bless me, God bless you. Yeah, so he did Dave Allen. And he always knew, he said this to me, I became friends uh, in later years. He said, I always knew when someone had impersonated my impression of Dave Allen and not gone to Dave Allen to look at because they used the right finger and it wasn't Amazing. the right one. Dave yeah. Allen was his left finger. So. It's, like, it's like a copyright thing, isn't it? Using the wrong yeah. finger. Well, That's it, my... it yeah. And I, I used to copy my guy when I first started, but that was the greatest bit of advice um, from anyone that's up and coming uh, doing Mimicry at the time. I sort of went from uh, that. I, had a, I, I, didn't, I left school at uh, 16, 17 with hardly any qualifications um and it, that didn't really matter because i had a i was very lucky i had a father who um, had a business i went into his business and i worked in a department store for a little while and then i started getting involved in an amateur variety um, group and we did some work for the, the, the old folks and charities and, and the different things and i got a bit of a taste for it and then i was working for my father at the time and i i did my first professional gig at uh, chertsey cricket club I think it was, yeah, it was Cricket Club. And um, I met a guy who was doing stag nights. Now, stags back then, stag and hen nights, uh, you'd have strippers, you'd have compare, and you'd have two comics. And I got into there, I was as green as anything. Green as Kermit Frag. And I went along and used to dine with my proverbial arse every night. But I learned my my apprenticeship there. I did about eight months of working, and I went from earning eighteen pounds fifty at Bentles in Kingston to earning four hundred pounds a week. Back then, right. you, you, wow! I bought my first car, uh, which was an orange uh, Ford Capri, with the money that I made on the stag circuit. And then I realised, and it was all strippers and 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 blue comics. And the people that I was working with were, were people at the time. Like Michael Barrymore was on the circuit, uh, Jim Davidson, Mike Reed, uh, Harry Scott, quite a few Charlie Smith. There's a lot of the comics that. Um, well, that era, they, they started there and then they moved forward. Now, I, I stopped after about eight months. I thought, this isn't for me. I want to go into more variety because yeah. I, I was very lucky. I could sort of, it wasn't only about doing dirty jokes, which was the thing then. It was about trying to develop my talent, which was mimicry and, and singing. And I wanted to a, a be sort of an all-rounder. And I wanted to be a family. It's not that I wanted to be a family entertainer. Hmm. A lot of people think you're a family entertainer. But that, that was the slot they gave me. Yeah. But really, I was an adult performer. I was always, I've always been an adult performer. And the material sometimes that, that I was having to do was was material that maybe I wouldn't choose to do in my live shows. But yeah. I, because I could do lots of different things, they could create a, a, a person. They could create a show around somebody like myself. So I was mm-hmm. very, very lucky. And I've had, I had some great, great years. I mean, I loved I, – I, I left uh, working for my father, and then I got my first bit of telly back in 1986 – Right. Uh, and then I went on to shows like Copycats yeah. and became um, the, 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 the mimic song Copycats. And when all the other people were doing Frank Spencer and Pushes and Vicky and Mr. Grimstad and all those old ones, I always tried to be uh, ahead of them. I always tried to do people that were never being done. Yeah. And that's why I think they picked me out of the group and gave me my own shows down there at TBS. I would have liked to have stayed at London Weekend, uh, but TBS gave me a better deal. So I went to TBS and I made about, uh, well, I think six series, uh, all in all, and about uh, six specials over the years. And uh, it was a great time. But then it changed. It did change. When Saturday Night Live came in, I think, oh, Ben Elton's out there, out there, all that, 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 that. And it was all these, and uh, um, it was a lo- wonderful uh, um, the comedian, what's his name? Uh, Hello, everybody, please. What's his name? He's said. Uh, so, uh, Ari Enfield. Ari Enfield. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then you had, you had Hayden Pace that came along, and they were mm-hmm. stay. But when it changed, it became like alternative comedy, and yeah. variety had to move out of the way, and it, it had to move out of the way. My stuff started looking very flimsy, and, and, and the material was weak compared to what they were putting on on Friday and Saturday Night Live. Mm. Couldn't compare it, and it had to go. It had to change. But then there's yeah. extraordinary things like, and I think a good entertainer is always a good entertainer. It's like that. Um, have you seen the the film of Bob Monkhouse's last gig that he did? Yes. It's, and it's, well, Monkhouse, I, Bob, Bob was one of my dear friends. Right. Bob told me if you had the uh, if you had the um, humbleness. Well, I've, I've always wanted to learn, and Bob told me one of the one, most wonderful bits to help me. I was starting out, you know, and, and he said, can I give you some advice? He says, mm, 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 can I give you some advice? I said, what is it? Bob? He said, 
the economy of words with a little joke. I said, what, what, what do you mean? He said, well, some people, if you meet people, I don't know, I'm doing the voice, but I can't remember how to do it now. Yeah. But he, he told me that you mustn't use too many jokes, uh, too many words within a joke. A, a, a joke is like a song, a rhythm of a song. And you meet lots of people in pubs and bars and they come up and tell you a joke and they go around the houses when they can shorten the joke right down to about yeah. uh, four lines. And it's the economy of, of words. And Bob was brilliant at that. He had a, and he also used a system which I use, a mnemonic system of memory. It's an old Chinese, it's, it's word association. A lot of mentalists, you know, magicians, mentalists like Dan Brown and uh, people like that, mm. they, they have this ability to remember things. And I learned that system, which I use to this day, and it's a fantastic um, tool that I can have. Right? So I'm, I'm, I'm a, an encyclopedia of jokes. Not yeah. all my own, of course. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't claim to do that. I'm, I'm a, back in our day, when, and our circuit was very guilty of that. They, we all tended to be telling the same sort of jokes. Um, yeah. <clears throat> it wasn't like, but, but it was, it's, as Frank Carson used to say, you know, we had to tell them. And it was. It's the way you tell a joke. The way you, so if I do impressions still to this day, if I do a new impression, I will take maybe a joke that I know or an older joke that you guys don't actually, you won't remember because you're too young mm. and they're very fresh now. The jokes yeah. still work, you know? And so it's, there's no harm in telling a joke. Maybe that I tell 30, that I told 30 years ago and dress it up. Yeah. And, and I think that's really shows that Bob Munghouse kid, because you can see it's like the young comics of the day are watching it and they all love it because he's just, oh, yeah, they're yeah. good jokes. Fantastically. Lots of people ask me what, what it is to be a comedian. I've said, said to my, my dad said to me, I was about 12, I was just, beginning of this conversation he said what do you want to be when you grow up i said i want to be a comedian and he said to me he said well Bob, if uh, if you can make just one person laugh then you're shit you've got to make a lot of people laugh <laughs> now i think that maybe it was a bob monkhouse um gag or the gag that went with bob monkhouse which he would be thank quite well known for any comic will yeah. tell you this is the fact that uh um when i told my my, my dad that i was going to be a comedian everyone laughed and then he went well we're not laughing now are they <laughs> yes that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but i love jokes yeah. and mimicry was the thing that sort of set me up to being i guess the name that i became mm. um and i still try it and find it's not so much there's some great impressionists out there some fantastic impressionists mm. great but you had roy bremen on here terrific yeah. isn't it? he very he very satirical he wasn't my kind of material but i could admire his mimicry mm. um and there's some great ones around Alison McGowan, you know, Danny Postill, who was a, is a, he must be one of these ones, Danny, because he's a fantastic yeah. person. Um, and there's lots of guys that can do great impressions, and you see them on the, the internet. You know, I look at them and I think, wow, that's a great impression, isn't it? And, but they don't have material, and yet material yeah. is very important. And the thing that makes a comedian, when they say, you can have the best material in the game, you can have the best, funniest, cl cleverest jokes, but if you're not likable, they, the audience won't warm to you. You've got to be likable. And Bob Monkhouse, who's one of the most technically brilliant comedians I've ever met, ever worked with, mm, yeah. I've ever seen, he had something which he was a bit too good. He came mm. across a little bit smarmy, a little bit cold, a little bit clever. And so mm. he didn't have the, the warmth that somebody like, let's say, Michael Barrymore yeah. had. He had that in bucket loads. He had, yeah. uh, he had compassion in his, in his work. Yeah, and yeah. people warmed to that. And there was a comedian around called Duncan Norvell, do you remember Duncan Norvell? Um, I know the name, yeah, yeah. Well, this is so many years ago, isn't it? And we, we were coming up at the same time. And he used to be the day that he used to go chase me. Come yes, on, of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was the first sort of camp comic to come out uh, of, of the circuit, of the circuit which was then, the writing mm. circuit, uh, who, who had a warmth about him, he had a charisma. Not necessarily the greatest mimic in the game, not, not the greatest talent, but he had something that... I didn't have. He had likability. Mm. I did have likability, but he had so much likability. And I think that's yeah. where Michael Barrymore, um, was, uh, that was what made him into a star. Because yeah. I used to work with Michael, and he used to die on his ass as well, <laughs> most nights when I saw him. But all of a sudden, the audience got him, and yeah. they warmed to him. Yeah. And you the know. funny thing is, as well, like you get certain people like that, people like Barrymore, people like Bruce Forsyth, people like Les Dawson, who can be quite insulting, but, but they're so likable and lovable, and you want yeah. to be insulted by them, whereas some people, that it just wouldn't really read well. So, yeah, it's an it's some people can Some people can get away with it, and some people can't. Mm. Depends on... Les Dawson was most... Again, he was a friend of mine. He was the most wonderful man. If he told me any advice... I always listened to, yeah. to, to the likes of him. And Frank, you, this is way before you talk, you, but you don't even know who Frankie Vaughan is. Do you remember Frankie Vaughan? I, I do. I, I'm, I don't know, yeah, I don't I'm know. into that yeah. sort of stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Right. So Frankie Vaughan was a, a, a crooner. He could have been a very big star. He could have gone to America. He looking 
a Jewish man who, who sung Give me the moonlight, give me the girl. He is stagecraft along with people like Max Fibros and Bruce and, and Desert Connor and, 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 and of that ilk. And, Bruce, and, and I worked with Frankie in my early, very early years, my first summer season. And he gave me one of the great bits of stagecraft. And this is something which I love to pass on the tricks of the trade, which are still so relevant now. And some of the younger comedians, no disrespect to them, they're fantastic comedians, but they don't have the stagecraft uh, because no one's taught them the stagecraft. Yeah, yeah. I, I, take, I make an exception when you look at um, Lee Evans. Now, his dad, Dave, who was a wonderful entertainer, right? you know, I worked with him, I worked with copycats with him. He's a wonderful entertainer. Sadly, passed away a couple of years ago. And he taught Lee, he taught Lee stagecraft, and you can see it in Lee. He's one of the few comics that, I, I get it frustrated when I see comedians come on and they seem to have like a, you've got to do this, you've got to go. They do their set, and however well it goes, they go, my name's been Fred Bloggs, thank you and good night. And they walk off. It's like a stock standard finish. Yeah. yeah. I'm not that, I'm of a different era. And Frankie Vaughan taught me how to take the round of applause or cool, it was called then. And it was a choreographed piece of stagecraft, which I use to this day. And it is a one, it's not, it's, it's a trick, it's stagecraft. Yeah. Like, like Ken Dodd had. Then all these mm. famous people learned that, like the, the clowns of, of the era. Mm. And I, I'll, I'll come on to the clowns in a second. But mm. Frankie Vaughan said, This is how you take your pose. You finish our, you, I always finish our song. And if they like you, he said, What you do, you hold your hands open like this mm. in humbleness, right? And take three steps backwards. One, two, three. Now, if the audience like you, because you're moving away from the, this is great bit of information for you guys. <laughs> yeah. you gonna, if they like you, when you move away from the microphone, they think you're going to finish. Okay. Mm. And they don't want you to finish if they like you. So they'll applaud. Oh, fantastic. Really yeah. going on that. Right? So don't, don't, please don't finish. Don't finish. Right? So you take three steps back. Then you look to the side, open your hands up and go. And then you take two steps forward. Right? Mm. Because you move two steps forward to the mic, they think you're going to do something more. Yeah. Or they're going to, going to do a little bit more, but you don't. Then you move three steps forward. And so then the applause goes down as you move forward. And the applause goes up as you move backwards. And it's three, two. Forward, three back, two forward. Yeah. Three back, two forward. And you can milk an audience and do all the things. They, they, they want me out here, you know. Mm. Show me the keys, I'll lock up. You yeah. give them this, you, you, <laughs> give, you give this, I can't, I can't, I've got to go, I've got to go. Look at your watch, you know, and, go, and then mm. you leave and then you come back on. Ooh, and they go, and it's, it's a piece of stagecraft, which I wish yeah. youngsters, when I speak to people, I'm telling you now this, I don't know if you're aware of that. If you ever get a chance to, to work that piece of stagecraft, mm. it's so valuable. Hmm. It's so valuable, and, it, and, 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 the, and, the, and the guys of my era that I came through, the Les Dawson's and the, and the and Bruce's and all, they all had it, Norman Wisdom yes. had it. And I'll tell you what he had as well. He had pathos. All hmm. great comics yeah. in my book have incredible pathos. Yeah. And uh, if you can play pathos and, and, and do it sincerely, Norman Wisdom was, was one of the greats. And, uh, and Robin Williams had it. You know, mm. Robin Williams, you know, he used to love Fantastic. He was a great comedian, but he was also had that pathos. He could make you cry. Charlie Chaplin came back before him. They could make you cry. Buster Keaton, who's one of my heroes, mm. uh, they could make you cry mm. as well as make you laugh. And that is a very yeah. valuable thing to have. If you can sell that and make it sincere, yeah, um, the audience will pick up on that and love you more for it. You know? There was a thing when I went to, cause I went to see Brucey do um, a, a one-man show a couple of years before he died. Um, and um, he ended with a song just about him singing to the piano, and it was like the piano was like um, a partner or something and helping through the show, and it was just the most moving thing ever. Yeah. And there was, he did another song as well where he was singing about all his friends that he lost, and they had like video, uh, pictures of him with Nat King Cole and you know, all these extraordinary people, and it was just, yeah, this is the thing. I suppose the difference is now people used to learn on the job. People used to learn at theatres and in front of audiences. These days, a lot of comics, they start like on telly and then they do theatres and they don't necessarily know the sort of, like you say, the stagecraft, the sort of theatricality. It's, and it, yeah. it's so valid. I mean, and, I, and I've never stopped learning. If I don't know how to do something, mm. like play the mouth organ, I've, I've got my mouth organ. <laughs> I got this mouth organ. I met this guy, Elio Pace. We do a big charity show. I know him. Uh, He's an amazing muso, isn't he, Elio Pace? I know him, yeah. Yeah, and he does this great Billy Joel um, tribute show. So I bumped into him. I didn't know who he was. I bumped into him in my local village. And he came out and said, Bobby Devo, hello, please me. I'm Elio Pace. I said, oh, well, what do you do? He said, I'm a, a, a singer, a, a artist, and I do a, a Billy Joel songbook thing. I said, oh, great. And, I, and as it happened, I needed a musical act, one other musical act for my charity show. I said, um, would you come down to Woking and do this show with me? I've got some great names on there. Um, I can't remember 
the year that he was on. We had people like, I think Shaking Stevens was on. I get all, I pull all the favors and get all the people I know. <laughs> and, uh, and people like Des O'Connor's done it. Um, and I get the, the, the modern comics too. So um, Lee Max done it for me, Tim Vine's done it. Uh, last year we had um, um, Milton Jones came and did it very kindly for me. And, uh, and he was a lovely German guy, I think. He, uh, was it his, Henning? Henning Fan? Henning, Henning. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. Henning. Yeah. And so I asked the young, the younger comics to come along, and I also asked some of the traditional ones. Yeah. Um, and the combination of the two things, it works as long as you get the balance right. Yeah. Um, and so I've met Elio Pace, and I said, yeah, come on the show on one condition. He said, what's that? I said, I've always wanted to play the mouth organ. I do Billy Joel, but I've never, I've always wanted to do this. I've always wanted to play the mouth organ bit to piano man. Yeah. Right. And he said, I said, you can come on here, but can I sing that with you? Can I play the mouth organ and sing it? Yes. So then I go back and he, I said, what key do you do? And he said, C, get a C um, mouth organ. Yeah. Right. So this is it. So uh, I've got three weeks away from the show. So I've booked him in the brochure and everything. And I start to learn. I've never picked up a mouth organ in my life. Right. <laughs> so I, he said, it's in C and you just find the notes. I said, I'll practice. So every day for an hour, I'm there trying to find the notes. Yeah. Right. So I'm going, <laughs> no, that's not. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, and as it, as it turned out, it's only one in note. <laughs> I'm going up and down the scale. <laughs> this is my music. So, it, to do. so yeah. it took me like three weeks. And we get to the show, and I go out there, and we do um, Piano Man. And my kids, who were living with me at the time, uh, it was driving them up the wall. You know, <laughs> I'm going, trying to learn this big in music. And all they were going, shut the fuck up, shut up, we can't do this, <laughs> shut up, man. So on the night we go out there and I absolutely pin it and yeah. um, I still I do it in the show now my, my night shows and my daughter came in in the interval we did close the first half with Elio and we were singing and she was crying my middle daughter and I said who's upset you I said, oh, I'm smashing he, she, he said no David she said I'm at to listen to that shit for three weeks <laughs> said, you pinned it she said I'm yeah. crying because I'm so proud of you and do you know what mm-hmm. that's the reward Absolutely. yeah I'll play it. There you go. Lovely. Never leaves you. <laughs> oh, yeah, very good. And f- funnily enough, I believe, because we were talking about Billy Joel before when you came to Hitchin, and I think you were at the same gig as me in London uh, that he did. Did you go to Wembley? Mm. Oh, I, I went to Wembley. Yeah, to see Billy Joel. And he was amazing. I thought he was just uh, just yeah. a brilliant, and again, a brilliant showman. He knew how to sort of make the audience laugh. He knew, you know, yes, he got he them did. to choose what song they wanted out of a known one and an unknown one. Someone, Someone's out of shot. Who's... <laughs> it's my daughter, the daughter I've just been talking to oh. about. <laughs> Um, hang on, she's outside smoking a cigarette. Hang on, I'll just... Uh, okay. well, I won't tell you, <laughs> Come out, if you want to come and say hello, come in. So I'm on the Zoom thing. Oh, yeah, she's out smoking a little dreadful. She's <laughs> I'm very, very lucky. I had three gorgeous daughters. We did have four, but we hung one as an example. So <laughs> um, you can learn. And I'll tell you something. It was another piece of stage part, which was wonderful. I did pantomimes. Have you ever done a pantomime? Yes, yes. Yeah, both of us yeah, have. Yeah. Yeah. Grim more uh, so than me. What yeah, characters? Uh, well, I've done uh, Buttons... Um, I was a Tin, tin Man. man. Tin, man tin Man was the boss. Um, man. Yes. Um, I did a few sort of things like, um, what was I? I was in Puss in, Puss in Boots. And I can't remember what character I was in that. I was a character in that. The Boots. Pipe, the Boots. I don't know. It was a Boots. Puss, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I love Panto. My wife, um, until we had children, she was doing Panto in a different part of the country every every year. So um, Just to get away from you. Really. Just, just to get away from you. Yeah, mainly yeah. for that, yeah. But yeah. No, I love it. Panto. Love, love a Panto. And it, I have to say, uh, you're up there with the sort of the greats of Panto as far as I'm concerned in terms of, mm. you talk, it's, actually, you're talking about variety. Um, mm. the, what I find now is that the, the best place you can go and see people like yourself it, is in Panto. There's it's not many. A, it's a, it is an art form and people yeah. don't realise that. There's a lots of, mm. There's different ways of selling jokes in a pantomime. You'll never get if you if you do stand up. It's the yeah. repeating of it's a repeating of certain words. It, it, they say rule of three. You've probably heard that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and in a pantomime, the most important thing is to to um, as a comic because I I've played league comic. I haven't done uh, Dame or I haven't done Ugly Sisters or anything like that. I don't know if you because you, you work together all the time. Hmm. You guys should be looking at maybe getting in. in a, <laughs> Uh, company with the ugly sisters. We're certainly ugly say, yeah, we could we're definitely do that, more yeah. than ugly. Yeah. Enough. Yeah. And I would, I, I could help you with that because I obviously I've been doing it for forty years. Yeah. I don't know everything, and I was going to come onto this. There's a guy that we work with. I haven't worked with him for a few years called Charlie Caroli. He's a clown. 
Mm-hmm. And he, um, this is wonderful story. I hope I've got time to say this. Yeah, so yes. we used to do this big scene. It's called a slosh scene. It's a traditional mm-hmm. thing in the front And it's a long table. He's on one end. I'm on the other. Right. And his wife um, uh, did the serving of the custard. You know, the cream custard. The, the, yeah. The slosh thing. Yeah. And it was a, it was a, it was a recipe that he guarded with his life. He used to be downstairs about an hour before the show started with great big industrial whip, uh, whip, whippy things, you know, like mixing things. And he used to get, because the, the slosh, it couldn't be too runny, right? And it couldn't be too fluffy. Yeah? It'd be yeah. just right. So every night we did this routine and I had to fall off the chair, right? So I'm up one end, I fell off the chair and I got an all right laugh, okay? He would fall off after me and everyone would laugh. Yeah. <laughs> So, 10 days, I'm looking at this now. I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, and he could see me trying to work it out. And I tried to make it bigger. Whoa, we went full off. Ah, that feet in the air. Still got half a laugh. And then he got the whole laugh. And I couldn't figure that out. <laughs> and then he said, you haven't asked me yet, have you? I said, no, Charlie. You're not. I said, Tell me what, what I'm doing wrong. He said, no. He said, you're missing something very important. I said, Can you, will you tell me? He said, now you've asked me, I'll tell you a, a piece of stagecraft and a piece of, it's pretty easy when you actually analyse it. When you fall over tonight, don't look at, uh, don't try and be funny. Look at the audience. I went, all right, I will. And then you tell me what, what happens. Then when, when I fall over, you look at me and then look at the audience. Okay, so it comes to the bit and I fall over the chair and I look at the audience and only half the people are looking at me. Right. So I only get half the laugh, right? Charlie, before he falls over, smacks the table with his hands, did it every night, bang like that. Yeah. Then he fell over. Because right. smacking a table, it's called pulling focus. Everyone in the audience goes, yeah. Yeah. they're yeah. looking at everyone sees him fall over. Mm. Absolutely. So yeah. it gets the bigger laugh. Yeah. It's so simple. Yeah. And that's why comedians in the old days used to do this. They used to go, here's a funny story, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Yeah. Here's a funny story. Mm. And that's what they used to do. Clapping your hands pulls a focus so everyone can see it. It's yeah. simple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, yeah, I think exactly. Panto is so vital because I know, like, for me personally, um, the first theatre I went to was a pantomime and that is the reason why we're sat here today. If I hadn't seen that panto and, and been sort of captured by it and the, specifically the dame, mm. funny enough, Paul Laidlaw, I don't know if you know of Paul Laidlaw, who does? Uh, Paul Laidlaw, he's a dame and he's quite well known as a dame, but he, I okay. mean, he, he just, he was just wonderful and I just, yeah, it was the, it was the comedy, it was the, everything about it, I wanted to be an actor, I wanted to be a performer and if I hadn't seen that panto, Aladdin in like, you know, Gordon Craig and Stevenage uh, with Flamella yeah. Benjamin and him, I would not have done this. And so for many people, many people who never go to the theatre, that's the one time they get the chance to, kids. Yeah, and, and it's an and introduction to children as well. Yeah, yeah. It's the first time you see. And now yeah. they, they, it's, so, uh, it's so extravagant now. The costumes are amazing, the lighting now and the, and the sound and everything. It's, it can be truly magical. But sometimes, you know what, the most simplest, I did a pantomime at Easter, which I still, The, the Wizard of Oz, and, this, in, in, and the, to be truthful with it, it was cheap and cheerful. Yeah. Um, but you know what? It had a certain charm about it. Mm-hmm. And I played the scarecrow. You mentioned you did the Tin Man. Yeah. I played the scarecrow. And I said, how am I going to play this scarecrow? Because it was I was the lead comic um, in, in the thing. And I had most of the comic. I mean, I wrote, wrote most of the pantomime. I introduced my own routines, which, uh, again, it's something that you, you try and bring into uh, to, um, to a pantomime. Try and get your own stuff. Yeah. Not, not, not be just do the same as everyone else. Try and always try and be different. And I'll come on to that and try to find a, a way of doing sort of impression. Anyway, so I revisited my Wurzel Gummidge impression. You remember Wurzel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, that was one of my favourite impressions back in the, the late 80s. And if you ever see Wurzel Gummidge, everyone thinks, oh, good old Wurzel. He wasn't a very nice character. He was a, he was a thief. He was, yeah. he was horrible to the kids, you know. But he yeah. loved... He loved his head off as well, I believe. Valley. Did he, did he take his head off? To, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, no, he used to have different heads. It's quite yeah. sinister. I remember John him being Burton. quite scared. Yeah. 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 He was horrible. He used to go, yeah. oh, shut up, you pesky kid. Yeah. And the voice was like, I couldn't see this guy. Yeah. I'll be bothered to do it if you let me on the And I, I took that voice. I hadn't done it for like about 20 years. <laughs> but I took that character. And now I use, whenever I do The Wizard of Oz, I always do Wurzel oh. Gummidge. And I always uh, remember good old John Pertry. He was about six foot eight or something. He was a very tall fella. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, he was a fantastic, uh, mm. fantastic actor, and it's um, it's nice to revisit some of the, the the old things that you do, and then dress them up. Yeah, someone, yeah. do you know something? Someone sent me something wonderful. I don't know if I did it when I worked with you at the Hitchin. Hitchin. Um, someone sent me a picture of one of my shows that I did back in the late eighties, uh, and I was sitting in a chair, in a in a, like an office chair, mm. 
And I thought, and, it, and the picture was to be signed. I was going to sign it and send it back to him. I looked at the chair, and I'm sitting in this black office chair with some glasses on my lap, and I couldn't remember what I was doing. Then I remembered what it was. And it was a routine, and this is when I'm going to come on to say, find something different and how to present impressions. It's all really good. You can do great impressions, but you've got to present them in a slightly different way. So I remembered the routine, and I only did it for a couple of minutes. It was one of those warm-up routines before the sketch, sketches started in the show. Yeah. And it was me as Michael Parkinson, sitting there, saying, oh, you know, well, they're Michael Parkinson, sure. and I guess, you know, he's Michael K. Yeah. And I spun around in the chair, and I put the glasses on, uh, I've got my reading glasses here. Hello, my name's Michael Kane, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael Kane. Then I spun around again. He's David Nurebridge and a different pair of Hello, now, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then the more I spun around like this, round and round and round. And the tag of the routine was me standing up and falling over because I'm dizzy. Right. right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I thought about that. I thought, God, that's bloody brilliant. I'll, I'll make that all modern. So I'll do, uh, I'll do the modern people sitting in chairs like Graham Norton. Oh, <laughs> let me go stay. And then you, you spin around and then you're somebody else, modern impression. Yeah, do Jonathan Moss or something like that, you know, because they sit in a chair and hearing people and you, wish, you turn around. Hmm. And I thought to myself, this is going to take a lot of, who else sits in a chair? And I thought, <laughs> well, and so I get it, don't I? Now, this is where comedy is dangerous. I did, I decided to do Stephen Hawking. Right? <laughs> it sounds great, right. doesn't it? <laughs> and I did the, the look, and, and I don't want anyone to be offended by this, but I did the look, right, in a chair. And the impression I did in singing the Beach Boys, I get around and the chair would spin around and everything. And it was one of the best bits of comedy that I'd done for a very long time because it was original. No one was doing a routine. Any of you ever seen do a routine in a spinning chair? Only me, I think. But anyway, yeah. of course I couldn't <laughs> use it because it was so on PC. Yeah. But the irony People is going, though. Oh, you must have ridiculed really somebody who's, who's got a disability like that. And it, and it sat with me. It, it, I thought it was a wonderful piece of comedy, hmm. but it didn't sit with me well. And there's a secret to telling jokes, and you guys must know this because you've been doing it long enough. If you have any reservation about any joke and you think hmm. you shouldn't really be telling it, yep. if you think like that or you undersell it, if it's a rude joke or it's got rude words in it or it's a rude joke, um, don't ever take your foot off them. Do it the way that it should be done. Don't hmm. don't try and lighten it. Or don't try to damp it down. Um, do the gag. Because if you think it's wrong, and it, you know it's wrong or whatever, you shouldn't do it. Yeah, Simple yeah. as that. Yeah. And the funny thing is, like with Stephen Hawking, he had a great sense of humour. He was massively into he the did. Simpsons. He did. He would have loved drama. it. So yeah, he, he was sending himself up. Coming back to the coming back to the, the idea, you know, it's very easy to offend somebody, and, oh. and it, he would have loved it. It's the idea of the comedy which is great. And Ricky Gervais took some one of the best lines. He said, "I'd like a pound for everyone that I've offended with my my comedy." And then he was, "Hang on," he said, "I've got a pound." <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's he okay. don't care, and he does it, no, and, yeah. and I like that attitude. He I, can afford to do it. I can't afford to do that. <laughs> but uh, talking of impressions, I think in many ways your Cliff is more Cliff than Cliff. I, we're talking about things that are iconic in my mind when I was growing up. You doing Cliff yeah. Richard? Yeah. yeah. Well, Cliff's a friend of mine, and uh, <laughs> and the sad thing is, a few years ago I did a pantomime in Northampton, and I got the flu, right. and I damaged. I got a hemorrhage in my vocal cord. And it, it scarred my vocal cords. It's like a nodule. It's not actually yeah. a nodule. It's just a little bit of scarring. And I, have, I struggle now to sing. I, uh, I, I, I did certain impressions, singing impressions. So that's what I actually am. I'm a singing impressionist, yeah. believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And I do loads of singing impressions. And the comedy material goes around the, the, the songs. And that one has been damaged. So I struggle a little bit to do I can still do it. <laughs> you know, um, but uh, you know, when I actually sing songs, I have to know the tone. And I cheat, you know, so I can't, I, I can't go from middle to top voice. Right. It's a very difficult thing. And Neil Sadaka was, was one that uh, I used to be able to do really well. And that sits on that little, little bump. Right. Yeah, yeah. But Neil Sadaka speaks like that. Hello. How are you? It's Neil <laughs> Sadaka here. I love it. All those. And they were different impressions, weren't they? Yeah. They were I met Neil Sadaka, ones. funnily enough. Um, I, was, I was in the show Dreamboats and Petticoats in London. And the oh, night yeah, I... Yeah. The night I went on was when Tony Christie was leaving the show, and I, yeah. I went in a day early because they, they somebody pulled out, they were stuck. And Neil Sedaka was in the audience, um, yeah. and I hadn't yet learnt all the songs because I was going on a day early. So mm -hmm. I fucked up the bass part to um, "Happy Birthday, Sweet 16 in front of the guy that wrote it. <laughs> Can I tell you a wonderful story? Yes. I, I did a show called Rock with Laughter at the BBC, it was one of the last variety shows um, that they did under Bill Mo Moyer. And it was the last variety show, and the guy came in and they uh, took over the, from the BBC. Um, I can't remember his name now. Anyway, he was a bit of a, he was, a, he was a, like a, um, um, 
he was he was quite highbrow, yeah. and he wanted to get rid of anything that was sort of variety, and they buried the show. But we had guests on, and Neil Sedaka came on. And Neil Sedaka was in this studio setting up camera shots, and he was playing on a white piano just like mine. Right. And uh, he said, and I went in and introduced myself. So I said, Alan Mr. Sedaka, I said, I'm Robbie Lama, I'm the host of the show. Hello, and he, he didn't look up, you know. Hello, and he's playing like this, tinkling away. I said, would you do me, while well, we've got five minutes, would you, would you just do a few bars of my favourite song, Rosemary Blue? It's off the Emergence album, right? And, I, and he went, oh, you know that one. I said, yes. So he starts playing. I start joining in. Went, oh, my God, you sound like me. I said, well, I'm an impressionist. I, 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 I do impressions. I do you, and I love your music, and I've got your albums. Oh, lovely. So we do the show. And then on the Wednesday, uh, after it finished, we recorded it on the Saturday. On the Wednesday, I said, are you in London? He said, yes. I said, uh, would you like me to, as a, for coming on the show, would you like me to take you to dinner? We'll go to uh, Mr. Charles, Kenzie's. Hmm. So I took him to uh, Mr. Charles, and I, I was going out. <laughs> So he was back in scene, I took so long. And it was the three of us, and he sat at the back there overlooking. He was a lovely, lovely man. And then afterwards, I said, where are you staying? So I'm staying at the Savoy. <laughs> and so I said, oh, I'll drop you off there then. So he said, would you like to come in and play some tunes? Oh, tunes? And I said, Does I go, oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. So we went up to his suite, and he had an upright piano. He was yeah. just practicing uh, for his concerts in London. And we sat there for a, a, an hour, an hour and a half, and we sung all of his hits. I miss wow. the hungry years. Nice. And solitaires, the oh, it was magical, absolutely magical. Crazy. That was one of the most, one of the greatest nights I've ever had. I bet, I bet. Oh, uh, yeah. Funny enough, that reminds me of a Bruce Forsyth story when he was doing one of the uh, Saturday Night London Palladium, and I think Nat King Cole was a guest on the show, right. and Brucey e went in earlier, and Nat King Cole just played his new album to him, basically sat at the piano. I mean, imagine, imagine that. It's incredible. I heard my, you know, I've become my best friend in life, I, I guess, apart from Richard, who, who came around today and. and, and a couple of the uh, lobsters. <laughs> <laughs> and I, in 1971, I was coming out of school. My dad picked me up. I was 14, something like that. And uh, the radio came on, Radio 1 at the time. And a song came on called Nothing Rhymed. And I fell in love with the song. And I fell in love with the singer and songwriter, a guy called Gilbert O'Sullivan. Are you Gilbert? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. And something spiritual happened to me. I, I, I felt... Uh, a bond with him and I always knew that, that something would happen and mm. about 20 years later uh yeah it was 26 22 years later I actually met him through the business and we became the dearest and closest of friends and he his daughters were my bridesmaids when I got married right. uh, oh can imagine I've got to go and visit the ex-wife's grave tomorrow she's not dead she thinks I'm digging a fish pond <laughs> so I've got to stick a gag in anyway so he became <laughs> he was my hero and he's still my hero mm. and we have become the closest of friends we're like family together and I think that the universe works in that way. I think that if you really, truly want something and you, and if you really want it that bad, it will come to you. And all the things mm. uh, that I've wanted in my life, um, I've been very, very lucky and fortunate to have them. I've had grief as well. Everybody has, has bumps, and, bumps along the way. But um, if you have a goal, and I think one of the most, if you ever want to hear somebody that, that will give you, uh, what's the word for it, um, inspiration, is to watch Arnold Schwarzenegger. He does an inspirational talk. It's about having a goal. You've got to have a goal. And if you guys, I mean, I spoke to you when I came and worked with you guys. I mean, I've been around for hundreds of years, and my comedy is completely different to yours. And it's easy to say, well, he's an old fart. And of course, I am an old fart, really. And it's your turn now to, to go and do it. But if you really believe in what you want to do and you have a goal, then and you want it, you have to work very, very hard. Mm. And I remember when I was 20 years old, I went down to Eastbourne to the Congress Theatre, and there was a variety show on. And Roy Walker, do you remember Roy Walker? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Catchphrase. Catchphrase, so yes. Yeah. Catchphrase and say what you yeah. see. And, and it's uh, Mr. Chips. That was amazing. So, and they aired it as well, which is what I so, said. <laughs> yeah, they they aired, aired that episode. It was yeah. so I went backstage afterwards and I met him and I said, how do you get an act like that? And he just came out and did 20 minutes stand up. And, uh, and he said this to me, he said, it's just do an hour a day, Bob. And it's just an hour a day. An hour a day. And you know what? I still do an hour a day. Right. Even to this day. Oh, yeah. and that's that's 20, secret, 20, uh, yeah, for, uh, 41 years now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and you yeah. clearly care, you care about your work. And you say in the old yeah. part thing, that's not, well, there's a reason we wanted to talk to you. It's because you it. are one of those people that... I'm flattered. I'm flattered. It's, it's, I know that some people will, will just... I, I love it when the young comedians come up to me and they, if they know who I am. A lot of them don't know who I am, of course. Hmm. They're just they're young. Uh, but... People that show me respect, it's, it's lovely when you get that respect. And I know it's not my time now. Uh, I've never given up. But it's, uh, you've got to have a goal. And it's very difficult. When you've achieved your goal, like, 
got my goal was to get my own series and get my own shows. I got it. And then it goes away. Fame is, is fleeting. And it's not about, not bitter in any sense. Of the word. I, I'm frustrated that I didn't achieve, to me, I didn't achieve what I know I could have achieved. Uh, and when you lose your goal, it's very difficult to get that back. And I watched Tiger Woods last night. Did you see Tiger Woods? And it was a documentary with back. No. And he hasn't lost it. He, he's one of the greatest comebacks in, comebacks in, in the history of, um, of sport. And that's what you've got to have. You've got to have that dedication. You've got to work hard, but you've got to have a goal. And if you lose your goal and you don't know your direction, then you're going to be running around like a headless chicken. And I've done that quite a bit. But do you, do, you th- do you think now, like you mentioned variety um, and the sort of performer you are, but do you think it feels like now that there aren't people like yourself on sort of TV and mainstream programmes? And that's, I think that's really sad. But do you think that's true? I mean, do you think there's people now that kind of are like to have that kind of variety background and, and the sort of can do the range of things that you can do. Do you think they're around now? Because I don't feel like they are, not on mainstream TV. Anyway. No, you're not getting, you're not, I'll tell you what you, you haven't, you don't get. I mean, although you get it on panel shows and a couple of times, uh, you, you yeah. get, there's not the camaraderie. There's not the, um, it's very much individual now. It's quite yeah. a, lo- I think it's a lonelier business yeah. um, being a comedian now than it ever was because mm. when I was coming up doing comedy in theatres and stuff, we'd work with singers, we'd work with dancers, we'd work with jugglers magicians you know special acts and there was a it was a community and such uh but now it's it's quite a lonely thing you know you, you might work a comedy club and do your 20 minutes I, i've always thought that that and this is me being maybe being old-fashioned i always like to see a comedian come out who who doesn't turn up in his um day clothes he doesn't just turn up it, 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 they bring something which is slightly special i think that so many comedians now young comics just walk out in t-shirts and sneakers and they do their stuff and i i think that my background i, I like the gl- glamour of it all i stage yeah. my shows my 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 well we didn't do much obviously when i came to work with you guys it was very much uh, we were restricted but when you come and see a concert of mine i've got screens up and videos and lighting cues and sound cues and and different things and the audience participation uh it's all part of that and it's a shame that um it's not more celebrated if you know yeah. what i mean i, I wish, think that's I what wish they'd appreciate me a little bit more you know well, we, that's what we we, we both we, we both love that but i mean we're both from um drama school went to drama school same drama school and we're both from an acting background so uh, we both love the theatricality of that and like you say yeah. that's the sort of thing that's mm. that's missing from a lot of I don't Stand up for, anyway, for the people who uh, don't appreciate it, they're the people that do. I think you know, like, yeah. like with the oh, very yeah. fact that we've talked about people like uh, Brucey e and Dave Allen. Yeah. These are all people that you know, and Les Dawson that yeah. have. And I guess the difference is now younger people can see it because you know you've got YouTube. You can go, you can see Les Dawson. I love just watching um, Blankety Blank on Challenge with Les Dawson doing it because it's just brilliant, isn't it? Oh, he, was, yeah, yeah. he was so well. Yeah. He was such an eloquent man. He, 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 he was a wordsmith. You could. It was. He paint pictures. Beautiful yes. pictures, and then tag it with the most dreadful um, <laughs> tag, which was which. But it, it said he used to. I was sitting there looking up at the weather, looking up at the stars, and it's it scattered like like stardust, uh, like glitter on a mm. on a piece of black velvet. Mm. And he said, I sat there in the downstairs uh, outside the toilet, and he looked up, seeing the, the universe and all the lovely stars and like that. And he painted this wonderful picture, and he said, and he said, to, and he said, I said to myself. I must get a, a mucking roof on this shit house. <laughs> that, was, that was the tag. Yeah. And it, it's the way he painted it. And I, mm. that's, I love the way that people paint things. Uh, and yeah, yeah. You, you only have to look. One of the great Dave Allen routines was when he was teaching his kid out to tell the time. It's just mm. fantastic. But that stuff will have a longevity that a lot of the, the throwaway stuff won't have now. It's a different yeah. thing, you know, and, and I guess these things come and go. But uh, And also it's like, I think back in the day, like before your time as well, people had to have lots of skills. You had to be able, you know, like there's a good clip I saw recently of um, Brucey and Norman Wisdom on uh, Saturday Night London Palladium. And, yep. and then Brucey suddenly gets out an accordion and then uh, Norman Wisdom plays the drums and <laughs> like just the most exceptional musician. He plays the drums and oh. jazz clarinet. It's, it's you know who I worked with in pantomime? In um, I did I did, t- I did two. I did Milton Keynes in Bristol, and, and that was Mickey Rooney. Right. Now Mickey oh, Rooney yeah, was yeah. the biggest star in the world, and he could play instruments, he could act, he could dance, he could tell jokes, he could sing, and all of a sudden his life. He married eight, I think married eight times. I remember coming in seeing Frank Sinatra, "Fly Me to the Moon," and he went, "Shut up!" I said, "What's the matter, Mickey?" He went, "That." Motherfucking cook, sucker. He went off with my wife. What well, he did? He went Frank Sinatra. 
<laughs> I said, your wife? Who was your friend? And he, he went, Ava Gardner. He was married to Ava Gardner. Uh, ridiculous. And it was yeah. ridiculous. But you know yeah. what? He was a grumpy, oh. horrible old man, in a way. But I showed him respect because hey, it was Mickey Rooney. I'm working with yeah. Mickey Rooney. One of the greatest stars. You know what made him grumpy? The fact that he was so old he couldn't do what he used to be able to do anymore. And it used to yeah. frustrate him terribly. Yeah. And I remember watching one day in the dressing room. We were watching a film he was in. It was called A Mad Mad World. And it had Phil Silvers in. Uh, Ethel Mormon, uh, Spencer Tracy. It was a very famous film made in the 60s. And it all about chasing treasure. And I was laughing with Billy, my road manager, 32 years. And it, um, he could hear us laughing. And he came walking in in his underpants. And all pain. <laughs> oh, it was dreadful. And his underpants looked like the starting grid at Brands, actually. It was awful. It was, you know, and, he, and he used to like chocolate milkshakes. I always used to bring him in and say, thank you very much. He used to call me Buttons. Thank you, Buttons. <laughs> and he came in. He said, why are you watching there, Buttons? I said, I'm watching you, Mickey. And he looked at the telly, and I kid you not, he was 89 years old. He looked at that television, and he sat down, and the years fell off his face. It was like I was looking at a man in his 40s, 50s. He went, oh, yeah. Now I'll tell you about this. And I was in tears, because this guy there, he'd done it all, and he said, this is, it took us five days to film. They had it on a rock and thing, on a, on a cradle. And they did it. The, he was telling me all these lovely things. Yeah. And it was... It was, it was wonderful to work with a man like that. And, but he was losing it a bit. And I'll tell a dreadful thing I did. Sometimes he would come on and he'd forget what, what town he was in. Oh, and he'd go, it's, and I always gave him the last word in, in, out of respect. You say the last things to say goodnight. Yeah. Is he Mickey Rooney? Mickey Rooney. Yeah. Yeah. And he'd go, ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here in Milton Keynes with my beautiful wife, Jan, entertaining all of you. Good night. God bless you. And sometimes he'd forget where he was. And he turned around and go, it's great to be here in uh, And he used to turn to me and go, where are we, Buttons? I'd go, Milton Keynes. And he'd go, mm. it's great to be here in Milton Keynes. So he did a speech. And one night, I thought, I got the table at me. And he went, it's great to be here. And he couldn't remember. And he said, where are we, Buttons? I went, Wimbledon. He went, in Wimbledon. <laughs> We're not in fucking Wimbledon. <laughs> and the audience went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Had to be done, though. But, well, um, and that's, that's the thing, isn't it? Because some, some people are lucky. You get the Dick Van Dykes of the world, who, again, I think is a glorious performer who's utterly underrated. <laughs> but he can still do it, and he's in his 90s. If you, Danny Kaye. People yes. like Danny. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, wonderful people. And then, obviously, you, it's like the hand you're dealt, isn't it? Because some people just aren't able <laughs> to keep doing it like that. But well, I love it that all these people can pass it on. You know, they pass it on to you. You pass it I, on to But us. I was disappointed that, that, that it wasn't... It, it wasn't a case I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to be just an impressionist. I, mm. When I talked to Mike... We go out with Mike once once every year. He's, he's, he's got, got a few problems, um, but he was one of my heroes. I always remember it when we became friends. We went out with John Coltshaw, and so we went out with John, myself, who, who sort of was before. So it was Mike Yarwood generation. Then it was Bobby Davro. Now then it was John Coltshaw and Danny Posthill, who was, was a good friend of mine and, and, and a wonderful mimic. And there was three, four mimics there, and we were sitting around. And <laughs> the respect that we had for Mike, because uh, he did it. He had that. Bit. He had stage fright in the end. In the end. Drinking problem, yeah, and uh, I don't drink uh, a lot now. I don't, I don't drink any less, but I don't, drink, don't drink any more. That's a, that's the gag. See, I'm forgetting the gag today. <laughs> Sorry, we'll edit it. It'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. Someone said you, you drink. You've got no willpower. I said I've given that hundreds of times. So that, that's an example of how I work my my material. The the, the, the things that uh, I remember uh, that, and I went to see um. A pantomime at, uh, at the Palladium. I don't know if you've seen any of the Palladium pantomimes. No, I've heard a lot about them, but no, I haven't, I haven't seen it. They've got Julian Clary. He's yes, fantastic. yeah. Sort of Julian thing. I'm slipping into Julian, which wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> and mm. you go along and see it. It's not really a, a family pantomime. It's a no, I've heard, this is what I've heard. Yeah, particularly last year's. And a friend of mine is, is a guy called Gary Wilmot, who's a wonderful pantomime. Oh, he's great. Yeah, he's great. Brilliant. And he came out one year and he did the Can Can and he did all the all the um, uh, train stations, the underground train stations, sets the music in the can-can. So it's Austin Lee and, and Hounslow Heath and Hounslow and Weston. Da, da, da. And he went all the way through this thing. And marvellous. And I stood up and gave him a standing ovation. Sensation. So after the show, we were having a drink in the bar. And I said, I've got to tell you, that was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. He said, I bet you wish you'd thought of it. I said, I will do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> we laughed. So I spent a couple of days and I said, I was so impressed with that. I said, I'm going to... And I phoned him up. I said, would you mind dreadfully if I... It's called it's called modelling. Uh, would you mind if I took the idea with the music? I'll try and find some other music, but I couldn't find a better tune than you can, can. Um, but and, and I'll do my own version of it. He said, well, as long as you don't just nick... Because uh, <laughs> it took me months and months to learn. 
and it, none of it rhymed. None of it rhymed. So it was all that was what made it so brilliant. So I said, I'll do my own version. So I set to task, but it took me five days to write all the countries of the world. I decided there's 196 countries. And I, I, 90, the two of them aren't accepted because it's a country of Palestine and, and, the, and, the, and the Vatican. Sorry, I always thought it was a city, but it's also a country. Blah, yeah. blah, blah. So I wrote this routine. It took me five days to write, but then it took me five months to learn it. <laughs> and it took me ages. And what's so wonderful, and I, I realized that when uh, I'd been off the telly for a while, I went through a trip, trip for a divorce. And I'd, I was struggling because I had an act that worked and I lost, I lost interest in my, my business a little bit. And I had an act that worked so I could go anywhere to bed. It was all right. I didn't work at it. I was in a comedy club, which you probably had played, called the um, Bearcat down in Trickenham. Right, yeah, yeah. You know that place? Yes, yeah. Right. And I was in there watching a the football with a mate of mine and he said, there's a comedy club next door. I said, oh, let's go in the interval. And so I went next door and the lovely man, Graham James, he came out and said, oh, Bobby Darrow, do you want to get up and do a bit? I went, no, thank you. I've got, I've, they'd hate me. And I listened to a couple of comics, and they were all modern comics, alternative comics. Hmm. Uh, and I thought they'd, they'd hate me. And he said, go on, get up there and find me. So I had a couple of drinks. So I stood up in about 20 minutes. I tore the place apart. Right, yeah, yeah. And, it, and, and I came off there, and it changed me. And you know what? Right. It made, I, I realised what I was missing out of my life. And you must have this yourself as performers. I miss the fear. I miss oh. the fear of it not going well I missed and it's not taking a chance that you've got to you've got to take that chance you've got to have that fear and the fear is so exciting and when you pin it the reward is, is fantastic and when you've got something that really works don't change it if it works don't don't you know don't um, mend something that ain't broken and it takes a long time to get things that aren't broken which are real bankers and I'm sure you found the same with your stuff yeah. have you yeah yeah definitely yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. But the, ex the, the, the excitement I had when I went out and did the 192 countries, huh. and as you start it, it's a like three-minute routine, and I couldn't afford to make a mistake. Yeah. So it would start very slowly. It'd go Laos, Israel, Seychelles, Sierra Leone, Greece, Maldives, Cyprus, Comoros, Barbados, Belarus, New Zealand, Iceland, Finland, Thailand, Kenya, Ghana, Cuba, China, Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, and Pakistan, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan, the Japan, Japan, South Sudan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, I'm on to Iran, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, Thailand, Syria, and Vietnam, Czech Republic, Muslim. So it went all the way through. <laughs> and if I, excuse my friends, not that one country, mm. you know, it'd, it'd blow it. And yeah. it was such a pressure, but when it worked, this is one of the greatest things. And it's one of the most enjoyable bits that I do. It's not funny, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> but it's informative about the world. Yeah, this is it. You, yeah. Find, you learn something, don't you? Yeah. Well, with them, um, you, you say, obviously, you're... I, I'm sort of ask, answering for you, but you, you obviously your heart lies with live performance. How How is it doing something like EastEnders when you step into something like that, where it's an acting thing for yourself then, from from your background? How, how does that feel? I, I, I was, I'm glad I did EastEnders. Uh, but there's lots of great actors in there. There's some fantastic actors in there. Um, you know, Steve McFadden is a big part of mine. We've remained friends, been friends many years. He's a fantastic actor. And and, and uh, there's so many of them uh, in there that are great actors. And I, I didn't go in there thinking I was going to... I went in to learn. And I did learn. I, I was a bit nervous at first. I didn't act as well as I, I, I felt as I could have acted. But I learned an awful lot. But the dilemma was, for me, I made a better living doing corporate work and pantomimes and live shows and i couldn't really afford although they paid me okay they didn't pay me enough money really that, that i could afford not to turn down a pantomime because as you very kindly said i'm, I'm one of the, the ones that are up there sort of learning their, you're one of the biggies yeah yeah because yeah. you know, i've learned i've done my trade i've done my things I'm, I'm, I'm sort of always in in demand when it comes to pantos mm. um but i had to make a decision and unfortunately the decision i had to make was a financial one because they couldn't promise me. I said, look, if you give me a give me a good storyline, I'll I'll give up my income as a as a pantomime performer for one year. And 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 they couldn't promise me that, so I had to leave. And, and it sort of I didn't get out of it what I really wanted to get out of it. I got enough. Yeah. And then I did a play up in London at the at uh, the King's Head in Islington, I was reading which that. was for very very little money. And it was a, a really big demanding play. It was a three headed play, a three three man play called um, Not a Game for Boys. And it, uh, it was a big ask of me. And I went out there and I did it. So I had a great director. I had two great guys to work with. And uh, Ollie and Alan. And um, it was one of the greatest things I've done for 20 years. It, it, right. it gave me a belief that I could act. And I should have done a lot more acting. But I've been, it's my own fault. I can't mm. say it's some, it's, it's, it is a financial thing. I've, I've had mm. to try and make a certain amount of money to keep my, my 
life and my children and everything. And so I've probably been a bit, I'd like to think I haven't been selfish, but I'm beginning to think I'm running, I'm 61 years old now. There's lots of things I'd, I'd love to do. And I, I really thought I was going to be like Bruce. I thought that, 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 that it changed. The only person that's around now is probably Bradley, Bradley Walsh. Yeah. A great talent. He's, he's got. But, he, great but he's talent. had. A, he kind of came back, didn't he? Because he sort of was. I remember yeah. seeing him before he'd been on things like the Chase and things more recently. I saw him do like a charity gig, and that I hadn't heard of him for a while at that point. And this was probably mm. early two thousands. And um, and I thought he's amazing. I, where where's he been? Where's he been all this time? And then he kind of well, came no, back. He's, he's had a fantastic. Back, he? Yeah. yeah. He did Coronation Street. The part was yeah. great for him. And then Doctor he got Who offered the well. Chase. And it's the best yeah. game show. I mean, mm. not taking nothing away from Bradley. But Bradley can sing. Bradley, uh, yeah. now I go back, Bradley was at my wedding um, and Bradley was at my, my daughter's uh, christening. We were great friends. I don't get to see him an awful lot now, but he was a great comic too. He's a bloody good comic. And it, so he had, he had the multi thing. So he's probably the only one, the yeah. only one from my era, that, 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 apart from Des and Bruce, who sadly are getting too old now. But who Bruce, is fact. there? I think mm. if I look at the modern ones, you know, people like Michael, back to Michael. He's the new Bruce. I, I suppose so, but yeah. without the talent. If, if no, I'm not he doesn't say that because <laughs> Michael McIntyre, he is a fantastic comedian. Yeah, and you know he is what? a very good comedian. Yeah. It's not about what you like. No. It's, it doesn't matter what you like. And I, this some, and something that happened to me on a plane flying out to Portugal. And I was missing about all my friends and people like Alan Brazil and all the old footballers, you know, Alan Brazil and um, uh, Ray, Ray Parts and Peter Shilton and all the old footballers were all going out to do the Bobby Robson thing. And I was missing about, all had a few drinks. I went in the toilet and I did the old visual gag, opening the door, hit me foot and then it's, you know, had my wee, <laughs> took the toilet paper down the back of my trousers and I walked down the aisle like this with the toilet paper following me down. And a woman stopped me. She said, uh, that's not funny. I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> said, You're not funny. I don't think that's funny. I said, well, my friends are laughing. Yeah, well, they're, they're, yeah, sorry, I said, well, I don't think you're funny. And I said this to her. I said, well, I don't think you're attractive. But it don't mean to say that you've married someone who's got dodgy eyesight that thinks you are. Well, I don't think you are. She said, how rude of you? I said, no, it's not rude, actually. I would never have said that to you unless you give it out. I said, I make a living out of being funny. Hmm. Just because you don't like it, my friends laugh, laughed at it. Yeah. It's just not your cup of tea. Hmm. And I said to Alan Brazil, who had this garish yellow shirt, and I said, do you like your shirt, Alan? He said, of course I like that good shirt. I said, that's why they make shirts for people of your taste. I said, it's only your taste. Never be put off by other people's opinions and taste. Mm. Okay? It's, you know, the only critic you should care about, fellas, are you. Mm -hmm. All that matters. Absolutely, yeah. And I went yeah. to see Les Mis, 150 quid a ticket, mm. and I hated it. And I, at the car, I said, I can't sit through another half, now, another half of this. I'm really not enjoying it. It's horrible. doesn't make it. A bad show. No, absolutely. It's a no, brilliant no, show. No. Just want no. my cup of tea. I was, no, absolutely. I, I was going to say what, one thing as well, because like, what's, what's very clear about you is that you love what you do. I mean, you also understand it's practical, it's a job, you need to earn your living. But I mean, And you mentioned Michael Barrymore, and he's someone that Glenn and I have um, worked with and saw us in Edinburgh and has been very, very supportive of us. And he's yeah. one of those people, I think, again, who has just adapted, hasn't he, Glenn? Because we saw him, he was in absolutely, a play about yeah. Spike Milligan. And I, I was a yep. bit, I had sort of misgivings. So I just, you know, I just had the assumption he wouldn't be good in it. He was fantastic. And we saw him do so, it. He, he, I did a, I did one of his, he did a sitcom a few years before. Oh, was it Bob um, Martin? Was it that? Yes, one? it was Bob Martin. Was I actually was on the show. Oh, really? He was right. Yeah. yeah. And he was a good actor. He was, he, yeah. he was such a talent. Yeah. Such a talent. And it was dreadful what happened to him. Yes. But I don't really want to go there. You know, he's a friend of mine. And uh, it's, you know, these things have happened. It's, it's been well documented. Mm. And it was unfortunately, unfortunate for what happened to him, you know. But then again, it was unfortunate what happened to the poor fellow. So, you, you, gosh, yeah. you know, these things happen. I mean, I remember seeing Stan Borman. You remember Stan Borman's a comic? Mm. Yeah. Mm. And he was on the Des O'Connor show and he went, uh, he's, 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 you know, he's, he's a bit like uh, John Dickey, you know, but John Dickey, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. he, Stan was before his time. And Stan did this routine about the pockets. He said, these fuckers, these fuckers were Mr. Smith. And it was then, it was a live show going out on the Desert Connor show on Wednesday at 8. <laughs> and he, uh, he got banned off television. Right, yeah. But, it's, it's mild compared to what yeah. goes on now. I, I, yeah. I despair sometimes about the kind of material that people can get away with now. Hmm. Uh, let's just say, and, and not knocking him because he's a very nice man and very good comedian, it's Jimmy Carr. Hmm. Now he can get away with doing outrageous material. Right, it could be deemed as extremely bad taste or sexist or whatever. 
Mm. He'll do it because it's only a joke. It's only a joke. Uh, uh, uh. And mm. he'll do it. But if I did it, I'd be pillowing and, and, and told that I'm, I'm out of date. But it's because he's contemporary that he, it's acceptable from him. You know, yeah. it's a bit yeah. hypocrit. It's a bit mm. hypocritical. Yeah, there's a lot of that. And but I mean, again, talking yeah. about Michael Barrymore, he a bit like you, so so supportive. And I remember like he he got people to come and see our show in Edinburgh. And and we only found out afterwards that he'd said to them, "Oh, go and see those guys." You know, just the most supportive guy, and obviously had a terrible time with the press. There's a question here, which I don't know if Grim, you've had your eye on it. Um, oh, I just see is the Andrew Hall. Yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. That's uh, actually leads on quite nicely to the next sort of thing we we're going to talk about. But it says, "Did you enjoy uh, taking part in Celebrity Big Brother and Dancing on Ice? And would you ever be interested in another reality TV show now?" Yeah, Jay. So that's sort of. Hang on, so I'm just trying to find me color color. I think that. Um, uh, okay, so it is all about sort of reality shows now. Um, going back to Dancing on Ice, my agent phoned up and said, have you ever skated? We're not, not in my life. He said, well, you've been up with Dancing on Ice. Go and see if you can skate. So off I go down to Guildford to get ice ring. And, they, um, and I look at all these old women going around, all these old people, pensioners, and the kids spinning around and jumping up in the air. And I thought, you can't be that difficult can it <laughs> give me them boots so i put them on and i've gone out on the ice and of course i've fallen flat on the ass and then i've tried to stand up and i'm pulling the pensioners and all the kids down <laughs> trying to grab hold of anything that went by. And, and they put a big announcement they said can the gentleman in the tracksuit please come off the ice all right come well, on. you might be bobby right. davro yeah <laughs> i didn't know bobby davro yeah, i didn't yeah. tell him and they gave me a penguin you had to oh, yeah, the penguins. yeah 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 Dunkin penguin going like this and i've got terrible feet i've got a bunion on my left foot <laughs> Agony, and uh, I phoned up. My agent phoned up. Arthur said, "How did you get on?" I was crying. I went, "I can't do this. You're gonna kill me." She said, "Well," she said, "they're not much older here. They want you to do it. Persevere." So I went, all right then. So it took me, it took me like a month before I could actually get from one side of the rink to the other side. Um, and then when I started to go backwards, it gave me a bit more confidence. But I hated the show, to be honest with you. It wasn't only about the pain that I had to go through. Uh, I hated it because of the politics of, of it as well. Right. They, they, they don't treat you, or they didn't on that show particularly, with any respect. They, they expected you to, it, you were just part of the, mm. of the show. It, 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 it didn't matter. It was all about the show. It wasn't about the, per, the performance. Right. And it's a bit the same with Big Brother. I was very lucky to, to be asked to do that. I think they put me in there because it was quite well documented that I've been through a, a bit of a, an emotional time with my divorce. Let's get in there. Let's feed. Let's try and mm. get him to cry. Let's see the, the comedian, the sad clown. And I wasn't in that place. I was in a great place at that time. Mm. And it didn't apply to me. I mean, I, I obviously you, you went in there and they paid me a fair. It was lovely, and that's what I did with it. But it's not what I want to do. I want to be a performer. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I don't want to wood stain a floor, bake a cake, or dig a garden up. You know, <laughs> you know, I can't dance. I can't cook. I can't skate. I ain't got a gun. I've got fuck all in the attic. I stand no chance. <laughs> and now we're watching these shows, and I despair sometimes. At Britain's got talent and things like yeah. that. You've got to have some sort of sob story, you know. My granddad's got a prolapsed arse or something, and my auntie's got emphysema. Oh, you've met him later. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it's very sad that it's too. It's about the show, and it's not about talent, yeah. you know. And I don't want really. I'm very grateful that I'm still asked to do shows like celebrity camping and celebrity cooking and things like that, mm. because that keeps me on the screen, I guess, mm. from time to time. I'd give anything to be able to go on there and perform again. Mm. I, I miss it. Yeah, yeah. When we did shows like Live at Majesties uh, and things like live shows going on there, and I had that was where my big break came from. Mm. Jimmy Tarbuck introduced me to one of these Live at Majesty shows, and I came out. I, I did Freddie Styles an impression and Lady Cliff. Uh -huh. Then I sat at the piano and sung songs with different people as Elton, mm. Sadaka, and Gilbert, and people like Billy Joe and stuff, Stevie Wonder, and all that. And it was my and I stole the show that night. And from the, it was that night that my career sort of started proper. Mm. And I miss that performing. I don't really want to go on these sell things from the back of my, my, my you know, from my attic or the back of my car boot mm. or cook things because I'm no good at it. I'm no good at that. I'm good at what I do for a living. I just wish I could get back on doing that. Yeah. But I'm not bitter because I had a really, really good go. Yeah, yeah. And, and I suppose that it may be a small um, thing to make it more positive, but you still did it. You still did those yeah. things. And that's a hell yeah. of a thing. And you're still, and you are still performing and, and finding new things mm -hmm. to do, new ideas. You clearly care about what he, you're doing. Now a day. Yeah. Now a day. Now a day. It's next We've got a couple of questions coming up, actually. We should share. Um, yep. I'll go with this one. Uh, Stephanie W says, have you thought about writing a book of your career? I mean, because you've got so many stories. 
Yeah. I've just finished my my last my latest book. Well, I've got two more pages of colour in. <laughs> um, I've just read a great book. Um, um, Katie's Katie. Uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, who's it? Uh, Jordan. Oh, oh um, Katie. Katie Price. Katie Price. Katie Price. Yes. Anyway, all, all the men I have in shack. Well, I say it's a book, it's more of a leaflet. <laughs> We're sticking a couple of those guys. Um, I don't, I, I, I think that it would have paid, I've actually written a play. That's what I've done in the last uh, uh, 10 weeks. Right. I wrote a play with, for me and Les Dennis. Oh, I saw about this. Oh, I saw right. it on Twitter, I think. Yeah. It, it just is. And, it, and it, it, it was, I was really proud of it. It's a bit, it was difficult for me because I had to put myself up as a bit being un, a bit un-PC, which to make the play work. Right. And actually he was right in many ways. He said that, um, you're asking for trouble there because they're going to look at that and think that that's what you really are. Well, I'm not. But to make the play work, it, it had to include it. So I've got to rewrite some of it. But it's a, it was lovely to write a play. And I'm very proud of, of, of being able to finish it. We finished, I started it about four years ago and I stopped doing it and then finished it off these last few weeks. So I've, I've made the most of it. I've watched a lot of the old black and white movies right. as well, as I like to call it, interracial porn. And, um, <laughs> get that one. And uh, <laughs> it's difficult. You can't get any laughs on this. Thing. Yeah, I know. I love, I love. Um, Despite myself. Um, a question from Neelam. Uh, what's the connection with the name Davro? Uh, what, what, where did ah, it, oh, yeah. Because it's a, obviously so a my station. Real name, mm. My real name is Robert. Yeah. Robert Nankyville. Yeah. Now, my father, that's N-A-N-K-E-V-I-L-L. My father was a very famous uh, athlete back in the 1948-52. He was in two Olympics. And uh, I want to be just like him and win the gold medal. And uh, he, he wanted to win it too to become sick. So he um, he was a famous athlete, and he ran with Bannister and Chatterway and stuff, and did two limit. Mm, I saw it. It's incredible. Yeah. So the Davro bit. My, I mentioned my my dad's business. My brother's called David, and I'm called Robert. And so when my dad created his business, he used the Dav of David and the R of Robert. I called it Davro. Davro discount stores, and I couldn't think of a better name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's what I used. Oh, right. I don't particularly like the name. I would have. Only maybe chosen so I'm stuck with it now. Really. It's a lovely backstory, though. Yeah. But do, do you think the fact that your dad, being an Olympic athlete, um, being involved in that, heading up to the four minute mile thing, wasn't his best time like four minutes eight or something, which is crazy. Um, yeah, four, I think it's four to six, actually. Four, uh, but and, uh, I mean, but like do you, having him do that, did that sort of give you the sense that you could do anything you wanted, that it was that it was possible, you know? Now, you're, 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 you're treading on something that's a bit sensitive to me okay. because my brother. David, my brother was a very good golfer. He became an international youth player. He used to play in the English international things with people like Sandy Lyle and uh, Chubby Chandler, who went on to management and stuff like that. And quite a lot of the old, old sort of players, maybe, um, I'm trying to think of the names. Well, anyway, Sandy Lyle springs to mind. Yeah. They were youngsters, you know. And my dad, being a sportsman, um, supported my father. He, and he, I'm going to tell you something quite strange. You know, I did a show a couple of years ago called In Therapy. Mm, yeah. And um, they had me on there and they implied that I was an alcoholic. I'm certainly not an alcoholic. Um, I know someone very close to me is an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic. Yeah. But I, I, I drink too many units. I'm sure I don't know mm. if you drink at all, but um, I am, I'm probably drinking even more now because of this. I think everyone is. Out. A lot of people are. I'm certainly, mm. I'm certainly not an alcoholic. And um, we went on this show and, and the, the therapist touched on something. And I have a play. They said, what's your favorite place? And I, it was Wentworth Golf Club. We were members at Wentworth for a long time. And my dad used to drop me off at a pond on the short course and used to drive off with my brother uh, to play golf. And then when they finished golf, he'd come back, pick me up and take me home. Now, that pond represented something so wonderful to me. And I could never figure out what it was until I did this therapy show. <laughs> then I realized, and this had come out for some sort of what you just said, my dad, being a sportsman, loved doing the sport with my brother. Mm. And my dad, um, I felt a sense of rejection and abandonment because mm. I always remembered, and I'd forgotten about this. He drove off, and I used to think, God, Dad, I wish, wish he'd stay with me and come fishing instead of going golfing with Dad, yeah. with my brother. Uh, and he didn't do that. And I felt for only a couple of years, three years maybe, um, and I always used to feel a bit abandoned, which is, is ridiculous because my dad has been. My hero is my, mm. my it's, it, I love my father's and still about 95. He still touches his toes with his testicles. <laughs> so, <laughs> keep it like. so anyway, and I never realized why it was my favorite place. But what had happened was when he used to leave me there and I used to catch fish, um, which I still do. I love going fishing. Um, it actually brought me so much pleasure and it replaced the pain of him leaving me. And I never realized that until they talked about it in, in therapy. And um, it was something that um, 
It was a, a wonderful eye opener. It made me it made me very tearful at the time. Mm. Uh, and they sort of pinned the editing on that again. It's a bit biased. They edited it so it looked like I had I was a sad alcoholic. Right, yeah. it, well, I wasn't tearful about me being a drinker. Mm. I was tearful about the things that had happened in my life. Yeah. And that's what can happen with television. I think it's happening very much in the media now. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it can be very biased. And I don't want to get into politics. Because you asked me before we started about uh, the Admiral Bremen. I'm not a political um, uh, impressionist. And I do one gag, which I've done for every impression I've done. I've done John Major, Tony Blair. So John Major would speak very much like that. It used to be Jules Holland. Basically, Jules Holland became this side of the studio. Yeah. And here's a the The necklace wonder. Yeah. Yeah. And then I slowed it down. And it just became John Major, basically. It was a lot slower. <laughs> pair of glasses. And then I'd start, you know, I started to tell him there. Blah, blah, blah. You know, I'll tell you. And then I use it now for my Donald Trump impression. Hmm. And uh, it's this gag. And I'll do the gag. I've got a hat here. Oh, she took the trouble. I won't put the mask. I do use a mask. <laughs> I'll use a mask, but I won't, I won't do it. It's, it's a bit... Incredible. <laughs> we, we've all got a Donald Trump mask <laughs> just out yeah. of shot, just in case. <laughs> to to make the mask, I can use the mask, I can use the hat. I use the hat. <laughs> it's a little bit so, Michael Myers. It's a little bit Halloween. It's a bit scary, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, my mind, yeah. it's what happens when you drink too much of that bleach. Yeah. It makes it oh, God. Well, I use this hat. Mm. And then you can do Donald Trump. Mm. Because this is the joke, you know. It's Donald J. Trump. Donald J. What does the J stand for? Genius. Genius. <laughs> if we were an empire, this is the gag I used to do as John Major as Tony Blair. And it's the same gag. I've been doing it for so many years. And it's this. You know, folks, if we were an empire, I'd be an emperor. If we were a kingdom, I'd be a king. But we're just a country. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that might actually be the the end point of the interview? I think that's that's, got that's brilliant. That's, that's oh, really? well, yeah. There must be some questions. Come well, on, give me some questions. I mean, well, let's see what else we got. I, mean, I have to say that this is absolutely lovely to be able to spend this time with you doing yeah. this. It really, really is. I'll just have a look and see what else. And we've are got. you a good fellas? And you know what I love about you? What's that? Go on. Is that I could see the you know, determination that I see, and, I'm, and please don't think I'm being condescending no, in any no, way. No, no. You're striving to get something which is original. You keep doing that keep finding something that other people um that don't do find mm. i say do your own stuff i mean i'm guilty of telling jokes that other comedians tell yeah. uh more from my generation mm. but to find something original and if it is original it doesn't always have to be the funniest it doesn't always have to be the very best mm. but if it's original the audience will find you and you just keep battling away and finding something which People go, well, that's uh, that's uh, doggy and F grave, or F grave and doggy. I never know which is the billing. Well, it changes as according to. Maybe it should be an age thing. Really. Well, know. then it should be F grave yeah. and doggy then. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Alphabetically, yeah. D, D, yeah. <laughs> and someone here. I, used, I did. A, I'll tell you something. And this is this is kind of talk about alphabets. I did another thing back uh, in the late eighties, and it was the alphabet of impressions. Now that was in nineteen eighty seven. Now it's. I was, if I'm going to praise myself, it, it was a way of doing impressions of 26 or, or, or an impression uh, done to the alphabet. And I'm going to do a little bit for it. Yeah. Uh, but other people have got, had the idea now. Mm. So a lot of t- took it up. And I think I was the first. So the alpha, the impressions alphabet, and I had to modernize it. So this is, I'm trying to remember it. I only use it usually if I'm doing radio is like this. So it's the alphabet of impressions. So it's Alpha Army, Alan Carl Chayman. And uh, blah, 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 beers for Boris or Canadian Joe Brand. Uh, she's Billy Connolly uh, or Captain Jack Sparrow. <laughs> and D, uh, e, what's going to be? He's Damien Everidge or the Botha, Chris Eubank. Oh, I've forgotten that. Hang on, I've, got, I've gone out of tick six. Still still it, to it now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, D, D is for Dill Boy or David Attenborough. He's Damien Everidge or the Botha, Chris Eubank. <laughs> and there's Forrest Gump um, or the bo- box of uh, Bruno's Frank. I'll get there in a minute. <laughs> he is Bob Geldof, he's settled and done. And H, H, Harry Hill. Oh, Homie Simpson. <laughs> and I go, I, I, as uh, Eddie Izzard, um, a dresser who's cross. And, and Jay is John Biffy or Jonathan Moss. And comedy is next, that begins with a K. And L, Lou Spence, dancing its guy. M's Michael McIntyre. Or Buddy McGuinness. And N is Green Norton, who likes chicken the piss. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, O's Ozzy Osbourne, or Paul O'Grady. And Piers Prince Charles, or Joe Pasquale. And Q is the Queen, she's a bit of a goer. And R is Robin Williams, or Rocky Balboa. <laughs> and we are S, S. Sarah or Alan Sugar, your fire. And D is Chris Tarrant. Uh, and what was the other bit? D is Chris Tarrant. 
Uh, hang on, I'll get it. <laughs> oh, Tony Blair, PN now retired. A big yards to you. Oh, here's a, here's a dreadful one. You, you talk with Albert. <laughs> I know that's not shit. <laughs> and me's Victor Melder, I don't believe it. <laughs> uh, uh, w is Kenny Williams, a very carry on actor. And uh, uh, w, X, oh, an X, Simon Cow, the star of X Factor. And then, oh, uh, Y is for the older. Near the end, we have got, and Z is for Zippy. That's the end of this part. Did you? <laughs> I've got a bit there. Uh, I struggle. No, it's still great. It's still so good. Um, and what I'm saying is to you guys is to find a, a way of doing comedy which hasn't been done. And it's so wonderful to see refreshing things. Well, thank you. And uh, I, I have to say, and I've said this to you, I think, before, but you did something very good for me personally. But when you came to um, Mostly a couple of years ago, and I was doing a preview that night for my new Edinburgh show, and you phoned up during the yes. day uh, just to sort of check some tech stuff, and you asked how I was doing. I said, And I was quite sort of nervous. It was about depression as well. So I was, I was the first time I was talking publicly about that. I said, oh, you know, I'm not really sure. And he said, no, it's the best thing. We're going to try something new. We're going to do a new thing tonight. It's exciting. And just that little thought made me go, yeah, no, you're right. That, you know, And it was just a little personal thing you said, and I thought, and that gave me a little bit of fire that made it work. And this is, so, and again, so just want to say thank you for that, really. Well, laughter, they say, isn't it? They say laughter is the best medicine. Unless you've got COVID-19 and then you find that the vaccine is coming on. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. We've had some... You've just got to keep safe and keep working at it yeah. and keep believing. And one of the things I've said, which is really relevant, don't let people say and destroy you by the criticism mm -hmm. because actually it mustn't, because it's only at their taste, yeah. okay? It doesn't mean to say they're right. The only people that count that criticise that you should listen to are yourselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, and, yeah. and not reviewers, I think, is definitely one of the things. Yeah, definitely. Not reviewers, because, yeah. again, they're just, they're just people who have a certain amount of taste, and a lot of them are going with the easy option yeah. of, oh, well, we can't really Invention. like them. Yeah. It, yeah. it wouldn't be mm. that's and such. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you just, just do what you want to do. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, we've got some lovely praise just generally yes. about you here. Pete Haynes says, I could listen to Bobby talk all night. Andrew yeah. Hall said, this has been another great night. Bobby has been great to listen to. I love the country song to the can-can. So, <laughs> and also so, somebody else said their love of Dave Allen as well. So, Mauritius, Panama, Guitar, the UAE, Solomon Islands, Equatorial Guinea, Kiribati, Young Ukraine, St. Lucia, Samoa, Spain, Vanua, Tu and Tuvalu, St. Kitts, Navis, Dominican Republic, Antigua, Kuwait, Barbuda, Myanmar, Scotland, <laughs> Ireland, Wales and... England. Then the, the flag comes in. That's the um, idea. Yeah. <laughs> Bobby, it's so lovely to be able to spend the evening with you. Thanks yes. for bringing us into your house and talking to us. Um, and we could talk to you forever. We'll talk to you again, hopefully, as well. We'll do another one of these sometime. But yeah, I'd definitely. Love to. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to. And thank you for all those. I hope I haven't um, blabbed away too no, long. It's been no, it's much. brilliant. It's been lovely. So thank nice. you so much. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. You, you take care, Bobby, um, um, and we'll see you soon, hopefully. Um, but thank you so oh, much. I hope so. Keep safe, thank everybody. You. Thanks very thank much. You, Bobby. So there we go. That was Bobby Davro. Bloody was and all. It was good. Bloody it? was. It was I good. Like it was really good. Um, it was. Uh, I mean, all of these interviews have been insightful. I think. Yeah. But it was just nice. I don't know. There was a moment in it when I, we were doing it. And I was watching the questions coming in and stuff, and I was thinking about from the perspective of the people listening to it. And I think it's kind of a bit of a privilege because you don't expect to be in a situation where you're sort of having a private audience with someone like um, Bobby, with his sort of background, his stories, his abilities his entertainment you know no, he's an entertaining no, exactly. person and we like we said on a previous episode we wouldn't have been so fortunate to do this if it hadn't been for the difficult circumstances we're in you know we might have done an interview with him wouldn't have been quite the same it was it was a bit more special and so yeah it's, it is you have to take the positives out of these situations don't you yeah absolutely yeah you do yeah it's that, and that and that's it and it's been it was really nice. Um, I just want to clarify. There was one thing that we talked about when I briefly mentioned Michael Mack. Oh, is this about Michael? Because I, I was going to sell this to the comic, <laughs> the local paper. I was my, my out Glenn Doggett in, in <laughs> McIntyre Hatred Shocker. I thought, brilliant. But, this is my way. But, um, but just to clarify my point, and I think the thing is, the trouble is when you're in an interview situation you like him, that, you, you, you say one thing and then it kind of, you hate sort of him, leads to the next point. You think he's really but, not funny. But I have to say, if I'm 100% really honest, don't like I don't, him. I actually, he's the sort of person, I don't watch a lot of the stuff he's done, but I, I, you quite often on things don't come up on Facebook bit, bits of his material you despise and, him, and I ben. always you despise like, him no I, it's like, <laughs> I, do, I genuinely and this is I've I'm seen the look in your hard eye to sound you? sincere but I do really love his material I think do think he's a great um, his material is great and I do think his performance is great and I do think he is very funny and appeals to such a wide range of people and his stories are very relatable the thing what I was wanted to clarify was that what I don't think he is and what, what I think Bobby Davro is and some of those uh, people like um, Bradley Walsh and Brian Connolly. He's not a variety 
act. He's not someone no. who has the appeal and has has the sort of uh, presence to run the sort of show that he's doing running mm. on TV. So he's a great stand up and he does his material well. But when you put him in the environment of the show that he's the the, the show that the Michael McIntyre show, whatever it's called, the thing that's mm. he does on TV, big show, big show like he's doing what. I think any of those people like Bobby Davro would have done really well, but not as well because he's not no. got the um, the skill set to do all of the what makes that show great. So he can do the stand up and he can do some some comedy stuff, but he's not <laughs> everything. He's not very everything else. So yeah, what I'm saying is he's a great stand up. He's not a variety act as we were talking about at the time, and that's where the context. So you're lies saying you don't in. like him, Grim? <laughs> <laughs> It's not going back from it, is there? The thing is, what you no can't one... see is Glenn's surrounded by a bank of lawyers, and they're all. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, as well, is no one will listen to this bit. So no. it would just be me. So, so no, everyone will just think that I just hate Michael McIntyre, which, to be honest, <laughs> I, I, I don't. I actually think he's quite funny, I, and I do quite like him. So, um, you know, there we go. Whereas I hate him. Uh, yeah. So that uh, that was the Bobby Davro episode. It was. Um, we had a lot of fun, um, yeah. and. Uh, and also, I do, I do, without making this episode more about Michael McIntyre than Bobby Davro, <laughs> uh, I, I do, I, and I'm going to do a timer after, so I'm going to see how much we talked, how much was coming yeah. down from this sort of like political situation of getting out yeah. of the McIntyre situation. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, the skills that we're talking about, they're mm. not easily learned. And people like, no. like, like, like someone like Davro, like, um, but then all the people that we're talking about, Brucey, these sort of people, they, yeah. they yeah. learn in a different way. They, they learn... Mm their trade in a very different way to how people do now. And I think that's what Bobby Davro was saying. So yeah. someone like Michael McIntyre, it'd kind of be a miracle if he was that good at the whole light entertainment thing because yeah. he didn't learn in the same way. He didn't have to do the same. He didn't play the windmill theatre like all the people used to play back in the no. day or even like Bobby Davro was talking about the sort of the stag night thing. And also some performers have that, some don't. I yeah. wouldn't be able to do it. Um, no, no, I, like, you no, would likewise. obviously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, we, we wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, it's very kind of you to say that. It'd be funny if, as I said, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. You said it exactly the same time. Yeah, yeah. you wouldn't have been able to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so yeah, that's that's a very very different thing. Um, mm. And also, you know, uh, Michael McIntyre's got lovely hair, chubby Pierce Brosnan. That's what I always think. True. Um, good, good description. Good. Yeah, yeah, I think that's his who's who. If that still exists, I often use that joke. I need to upgrade that to Wikipedia or something. Who's who? Who hasn't who? existed what since the like? Uh, it used to be like a book, a series of books, like an encyclopedia oh, A God. to Z okay. of people yeah. who were you. Oh, well, that yeah, that's what I don't, I, was. Even, I don't even know what that was. So every time I said that, you've gone. Ah, no, what? Oh no, um, I have heard. No, I have heard of it. I don't know. I'm thinking. You know, my brain is thinking. Guess who at the moment? And I'm thinking that's not really, that's not relevant. So I don't know why. <laughs> not that, not that I'm very no. tired. <laughs> it's not a book about the band The Who who's, and the, who's, and the who's members who? are. Who's, who's who? who? Well, it's Roger <laughs> yeah. Daltrey, Pete and Whistle, and <laughs> yeah. anyway, um, Peter. No, Pete Townsend. I got it wrong. Uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, we had a lot of fun. Most of it was trying to get out of a crisis that Glenn was concerned about with Michael McIntyre um, <laughs> and the hatred, which, I mean, actually, from that point in the interview, you, you, you stopped um, saying so much. You looked very worried. You were sweating. This is it. I was. Were, and I was just thinking, this is fucking brilliant. I'm going to sell this <laughs> to everyone I can find. Dog, it hates McIntyre. I just yeah. hope McIntyre never listens to the interview. That's my that's my worry. Then he'll never talk to me again. Not that he's ever spoken to me ever before. No. So you know, and but... probably never will. So I think no, you're safe, you really. Yeah, it's you're you right. know, and, and you covered it perfectly. We all know that you hate him. <laughs> um, so thank you for listening to this episode. Uh, yeah. it's, been, it's been a fun one. Um, it has. Yes. At, as we always say, there are plenty of others to listen to, uh, more than most of comedy podcasts, to keep an eye out for those. Yep. Um, and follow us on all the various different podcasting sites where you find those things. They're everywhere. Um, they're everywhere. Everywhere. It's quite sinister. Yep. Um, and we'll, we'll be back very soon with another one. So um, you're released now. This is your own time. Do your own thing. Um, listen to it again if you want. Um, yeah, why not? Yeah. And, and, uh, and definitely grab just the bit where Glenn says the thing about McIntyre. Grab the whole sort of debrief from it, put it up separately on YouTube somewhere. Um, just see what happens. I'm going to be doing Please that. Please don't. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> it really was not a serious thing you said. I, you know, you, 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 you've said worse. <laughs> true. I'm that's sure. true. Yeah. Um, and I certainly have. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, thank and you. We'll, we'll see you again next time. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>